From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Now, folks, long-time conspiracy realists who have been with us since the YouTube or even Apple video podcast days, uh, you know that we've been at this for a while, still haven't gotten black-bagged or turned by any number of shadowy organizations. Uh, And over the years, we've been able to do something a lot of folks don't get to do. We've been able to look at old cases we investigated when new evidence has come to light with the benefit of retrospect. And that's where kind of our tale begins today. Uh, back Back in our awesome video days, we looked into the tragic death of a guy named Dag Hammerschuld. And his name is not spelled the way it sounds, so apologies for that on the video. (laughs) We were young. Uh, But most people have never heard of this guy, uh, and you probably wouldn't have heard of him in this day and age unless you were super into the history of the United Nations or super into true crime documentaries from 2019. (laughs) Or maybe black metal bands. He was definitely the front man of one of those. No, he wasn't. But uh, people with similar names definitely were. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It is a very metal name. Um, In his day, this guy was a big mover and shaker. Youngest secretary general, a.k.a. leader of the United Nations. And even today, the story surrounding his death is incredibly murky. It's full of unaddressed conspiracy Uh, As a heads up going into this, it's a little bit different from a lot of episodes we do because I think it's safe to say, uh, get a gut check from you, Matt, and you, Noel, I think it's safe to say we have a horse in the race. We're just going to be open about our bias here. We do not buy the official narrative. We think it's more than likely that Dag Hammarskjöld was murdered and whoever wanted him dead totally got away with it for more than 60 years and counting. It's been 62 years since this guy died due to pilot error. I guess I just feel like anytime the word narrative is employed, it's probably smart to question it because it implies a story. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, It is a bit of a weaselly word, you know. So here are the facts. Let's introduce Dog. Uh, Noel, earlier you mentioned that he has a heck of a good name for some Swedish black metal. Uh, And just wait till you hear the full name of this economist and diplomat. Can I say it? Can I say it? Yeah, please, please, please. Dog Halmar Agne Karl Hammerskold. You know, black metal is the ah, and death metal is the ooh. Just if anyone was wondering the distinction. Unless you want to throw in some dry lung fear factory falsettos. Just shout out that. Oh, for sure. <laughs> uh, but this guy is, um, is a little bit of a Nepo baby. He's not a bad guy, <laughs> but we do have to say that he was born in July of 1905 to a very very well-off aristocratic family. Yes, he was the son of another Hjalmar Hammerskjold. Uh, and again, just pronouncing it uh, Hammerskjold, because that's how we've heard it pronounced in multiple places. It does look like it should be pronounced Hammerskjold. I think or the K Schold. is often silent in, uh, in, in Swedish names, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, but so Dag's father, Hjalmar, was the prime minister of Sweden. Oh, no no biggie. Just like top job in the whole country. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, this person, Kjalmar, was in office from 1914 until 1917. And then he went on to do even more stuff, pretty epic stuff. He was chairman of the Nobel Prize Foundation from 1929 until 1947. Whoa. All the way back when they were still giving prizes for dynamite. Kidding, kidding, kidding. Look up Alfred Nobel. Uh, this this guy, okay, 
I was trying to think of a way to put this in context for people who aren't too familiar with Sweden. So this guy actually considered Uppsala Castle his home, his childhood home. And it's a huge place. It's a big government building. Uh, it, it's kind of like somebody saying, I consider Congress, the hall of co- the Capitol, my childhood home. Would this have been the type of family that would have had like a crest I have to imagine oh, they did. 100%. Yeah. And like, what? look, what we're saying is, again, he's not a bad dude from everything we can find, but he was definitely not some started from the bottom, now we're here guy. And uh, for that fact, uh, neither was Drake. Maybe that's a story for a different <laughs> episode. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we saw him on uh, Degrassi, you know, mm. he was already kind of a star before he even uh, made a rap. Right. And so Dag Dag being uh, what we would call now maybe someone who benefited from nepotism, uh, despite that, he was also very smart. Like he wasn't just some lazy guy drifting on his family name. Well, let's also just point out that a lot of times nepo baby, I I hate that term, honestly, if I'm going to come out and make a hot take, I think it's a bit dismissive because yes, you have a great means with which to further your education, but it doesn't mean that you're stupid or lazy. I mean, someone with like zero aptitude put through the best of schooling still would not necessarily excel. Just putting that out there. Yeah, yeah. but they, they can <laughs> excel though. That's I the know, thing. I know. Yeah. And I'm just trying to be devil's advocate here a little bit because I think sometimes the Nepo baby thing gets thrown around in an overly dismissive way. Sure. It can be reductive, right? Um, Because sometimes people don't like to see other people succeed. And that's a problem. If you're like that, that's a problem for you and your therapist. But the the issue here is that this guy has, this guy has opportunity and he has luck and he has initiative and not for nothing. Are we bragging about his bona fides? Because he's only 25 years old when he gets degrees in philosophy and law. And matter of fact, by the time he's finish, finishing up his law degree, he already gets a job as assistant secretary of the unemployment committee. So he's already very highly placed in government uh, without having to you know, slog through a ton of internships and so on. Uh, he is in that position for about four years And while he is in that position, working full time, he is also writing his uh, economics thesis for his doctorate at Stockholm University. The English title of his thesis is The Spread of the Business Cycle. We also have it in Swedish and thought it would be fun uh, slash endearing and embarrassing for us to pronounce it. Ooh, ooh, can I do it? <laughs> yeah, let's all go, let's all give <laughs> yeah, it a go. I'm, I'm cheating though because I know how to say it. Oh, okay. Well, then do you want to be the 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 right answer at the end after we've uh, butchered I'll, it? I'll go after you guys. I'll go after okay. you guys. Uh, it's sort of like Farfignugen or like a lot of these German words like Bewangenheits, Bewaltigung, where it's uh, you know one giant word that encompasses more of a concept. This is Kong York Spring Springingen Springingen Spring Springingen. <laughs> now, now you. you <laughs> I don't know why I continue to try. I, uh, I, <laughs> I, I yield my time. Wow. Uh, okay, that's not what I was going to say. I was going to say, Konjunktur Spridnigen. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty great as well. Konjunktur uh, Spridnigen. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> which is, weirdly enough, uh, now I, I just, <laughs> I, uh, you know, you guys know I'm traveling, so my, my time is weird, so I was able to, spend some time just saying that to myself. Weirdly enough, uh, that that kind of awkward word for English speakers just translates to the economic spread, and it's not the whole... In, anyway, we just thought that would be fun. Apologies to all our Swedish friends. Uh, so this... Oh, roast this doctor, us. Write us, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, and, and show us some more Swedish words. You think it would be funny for us to try to pronounce. Uh, his doctorate is pretty good. It's pretty watertight. It's legit. So much so that he goes on to teach at Stockholm University at his alma mater for three years, uh, starting in 1933. And if you're in the world of academia, you know it's pretty common as you're pursuing a doctorate to get a job teaching at the same university in some capacity. Uh, after this, after he teaches there for about three years, he becomes a public servant again. He's working in the Ministry of Finance, 
And then he becomes the president of the board of the Bank of Sweden. Okay. That's a little bit of nepotism. That's a stretch. That's a yeah. leap right there. Wait, from yeah. like public servant to the Bank of Sweden. But also in Sweden, of- everything is a bit on the socialist side. So the bank would maybe be more linked in with uh, public education and stuff like that. For sure, for sure. And also pretty closely linked with some private enterprises, as we'll see. Uh, Past World War II, he is instrumental in the formation deployment of the Marshall Plan. He becomes kind of a power behind the throne of Swedish politics. He doesn't ever officially join a political party, uh, but his career continues to take him to higher and higher heights, eventually as high as the cruising altitude of an airplane. (laughs) But We'll get there in a second. Can we just state, just for anybody who was unaware of it, the Marshall Plan has to do with World War II and the rebuilding of Europe. And the United States provided funds for a lot of that. Yeah, because uh, the United States was in the catbird seat at the end of World War II. It retained a ton of its existing infrastructure. The only major attack on U.S. soil was uh, Pearl Harbor. And Europe, by contrast, was leveled in so many ways. Yeah. So I mean, that's sort of a uh, catbird seat like for life situation for the U.S. thus far anyway. And it, it continued, you know, uh, until quite recently. So uh, <laughs> for the purposes of our story, that's OK. So that's a high level background on our boy Dag. For the purposes of our story, the Dagster's most important job was becoming the secretary of the the Secretary General of the UN on April 10th, 1953. He was only the second person ever to hold this job at the time. The first chairman resigned. So he got a five-year job. And then the old boy network at the UN liked him. He was reelected in 1957 for another five years. And the UN at this time was really like a shiny beacon of possibility. I, I'd, I'd say it still had that new car smell, if you want to think of it that way, because everybody was comparing it to the League of Nations, which just absolutely shat the bed, you know? So they were like, <laughs> less, I know you love the term. So I they do. were like, <laughs> they were like lesson learned. Uh, we can but they do thought better. that this one would be better. This was an opportunity to really take it to the next level and uh, uh, succeed where that venture had failed. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, and the United Nations still continues today and does. You know, it's imperfect, but everybody knew it would be imperfect, and it's better to have it than to not have it, honestly. Uh, and that that is an apolitical statement. Anybody who tells you the, the United Nations or something like that should not exist is misleading someone, either you or themselves. Bit more of a tone setter than it is like a an actionable, you know, agency that can actually force people to do things. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at the Commission on Human Rights. It's like it's riddled with corruption and con- like conflicts of interest. But DAG at this time, if you're the secretary general, you're the second one ever, then your job is partially uh, to be an ambassador of the idea, to be a salesperson. So he's going around trying to sell a lot of people who like everyone from bankers to out and out warlords on the idea of cooperating. It's it's a tall milkshake. Uh, and he is also, it must be said, he is also when he's trying to negotiate peace, there's another side to that coin. He's also he's also negotiating uh the new the neo-colonial practices of resource extraction across what you would call the global south today. It's almost like smoothing over relationships between those interests that want the things out of the soil and then the countries that they're going into to get it from. That's what a truly good diplomat does, right? They just, they're like relationship management. Doesn't necessarily mean they come in utter peace because they have an agenda, but they can sell you an idea and convince you that it was kind of partly your idea, perhaps, or at the very least, not an egregious idea. And that's the kind of skill set this guy seemed to have. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, there's a lot of stuff in play, of course. His, he's one of those dudes who always has a busy day. We're talking everything from the Middle Eastern conflict to the Suez crisis to all the shifting theaters of the Cold War, which basically began 
way before it officially begins in your textbooks. Is the Suez Crisis dealing with the Suez Canal there there in yes. Egypt? Okay. Mm-hmm. Did it have to do with widening it or was it part of the built like there was an infrastructure issue or what was that exactly? The Suez Crisis uh, is sometimes called the Second Arab Israeli War. And this is where the, the – the, it's another chapter in the ongoing conflict between Israel and other countries in that region, the conflict that continues today, you know. And uh, this – which, you know, this conflict is um, – oh, gosh, this is its own podcast, let alone an episode. But what we're talking about here specifically – is a climactic moment in African history, modern African history, the Congo crisis. So there's this place, it was called the Belgian Congo. It was uh, run historically by Belgium, by King Leopold II, who was a real piece of shit. And uh, <laughs> no, it's true. There's no other way to say it. Check Never out. I met a Leopold that I liked. Just, uh, there's Leopold <laughs> Stokowski. But he was probably a jerk, too. He was a great conductor, but probably a real monster. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, uh, check out the Behind the Bastards on Leopold. Um, excellent work, as always, by our pal Robert Evans and co. Um, the Belgian Congo becomes independent on June 30th, 1960. Things immediately go wrong. We'll get into it, but the, the high-level thing you need to know is that DAG eventually sends a UN peacekeeping force, blue helmets, you could call them, to crack down on the subsequent civil disorder. The Soviet Union gets pissed. The U.S. sticks its nose in the mix. Um, the first democratically elected prime minister of the country, uh, Lumumba, is assassinated uh, the <laughs> things get crooked real quick. And so Dag Hammarskjöld goes on this secret mission to try to uh, negotiate with a secessionist state, a place called Katanga. And Katanga is a place that you you probably haven't heard of. And there's nothing wrong with it. You You probably haven't heard of it if you live in the United States and you don't have family or like a if you don't have a reason to read about it on your own, uh, Katanga was uh, one of the four large provinces of the Belgian Congo. And this was like the, um, you know, the Monopoly game. What are the two most important squares? In Park Place. Park Place. Board, boardwalk? And board, well, yeah, I think so. I think so. So, so this is like the park place. This is where all the, all the cool stuff that all the Western powers want is located. Katanga is very mineral rich. And uh, as a result, it has a lot of foreign companies and spies, the spies representing private sectors as well as state powers that are in the mix trying to get their slice of the pie. And they're the ones who – Shortly after uh, the Congo becomes independent, they're the ones who say, you know what, Katanga should succeed. Uh, Katanga should become its own thing. And those Belgian mining interests, those foreign powers are really pushing this for a number of resources. But the most dangerous one is uranium. Because keep in mind, the, ver the, the hottest new thing in geopolitics at this time, the Tickle Me Elmo, the PS5 <laughs> of the world is the atom bomb. Yeah. And uranium in general, so that you can test and attempt to build your own, depending on which country you are. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot at stake. Dag is aware of all of this. In September of 1961, he flies out in, on a secret peace uh peace brokering mission. The rest of the world doesn't know about this. And he's going to meet a guy named Moishe Tshombe, who is the president, the nominal president of this secessionist Katanga area. It's a heck of an info dump, but you need to know where he's going, why he was there, and you need to know he never made it. He's, he's flying near a place called Indola in modern day Zambia. Yeah, at the time it was a part of northern Rhodesia. Yeah, Rhodesia had a very troubled uh, history in terms of, you know, um, codified racism and things like that. Yeah. And just 
quickly, guys, wasn't this a late night secret mission? Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. It was, uh, you could say like one in the morning or shortly after midnight, they were, they were not trying to get a lot of press. You know what I yeah. mean? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and why would they? Because, you know, oftentimes leaders uh, at this level will travel in secret. You know, that's that, that even happens today. That's why those agendas, those itineraries are not publicly disclosed. That's why a lot of times, even if um, even if you live in the U.S., you might not know that the president is showing up until a few days before. And, and if you're the like traffic most, is jacked. Yeah. Right. If you're like most people in the US, you're not excited when they come to your city. You're thinking, uh, how am I gonna get to work? But it's so interesting when you really kind of boil down the nature of politics and diplomacy, it's about who's the top person and their word carries weight. And just sending them to a place has power. And that's a strategic move in and of itself. That's what the Pope has been doing for millennia really uh is that soft power just showing up and saying something that's often pretty vague what is it uh, walk soft and you know, talk soft and carry a big stick was that roosevelt big hat yeah uh, and uh so so dag never makes it the plane crashes it's a douglas d6 airliner and like you said it, it, it crashes in the wee hours uh in what would be modern day Zambia today, all the passengers aboard eventually die. There are 15 passengers, 14 die, including Dag in the crash. And one guy who we'll talk about a little bit later survives for five days in the hospital before succumbing to officially his wounds. The UN falls into chaos. Remember, it's new. It's untested. They don't have a precedent for this. They've got to have they've got to have somebody to be in charge. And ever since that time, the official story was either pilot error, according to a Rhodesian inquiry held the next year, or undetermined, according to a UN investigation. But nobody believes the official story, even like the people who are uh, propagating the official story behind closed doors. They know it's malarkey, as Biden would say. Uh, and in like the day after the crash, tons of people were already convinced it was a conspiracy at foot and a foot, a foot. No, keep it in. Sorry. It's a weird time. Not at foot, a foot. Uh, and they're, they're not all wing nuts or wearing tinfoil hats or what have you. They're pretty prominent people. And they, they are saying stuff that sounds positively conspiratorial. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Okay, when we say people that might surprise you, calling this a conspiracy afoot or at hand, who are we talking about? Who's the, like the, We found one famous guy who was... Ten toes down on the idea that this was a, an, a murder and a cover up. Yeah, it was it was Harry Truman, the president of these United States. And he said the DAG was, quote, on the point of getting something done when they killed him. Oh, snap. I mean, ah, uh, he's not in, he's not necessarily saying he was a, he's just acknowledging that he was doing good work and then he was killed. Well, they but killed it's him. a bit of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind he, of the he, statement. He didn't say when he died or when there was the accident. He said when they killed him. No, oh, that's fair. He, that's <laughs> sorry. I missed that part entirely. He did say they killed him. That's so it weird. was the it was the day after the crash yeah. that the president of the United States said this, and then he's like snarky about it because he says it again. He, he doubles when down. He says this. Yeah, he like pauses like for an ellipses and says, "Notice that I said." When they killed him. Whoa. This is the titular <laughs> they of our very podcast, uh, yep. fellow conspiracy realists. The they. I mean, who, who are the they? Uh, well, let's discuss. Yeah, yeah, because people asked him too, because that's some wild stuff for the president to say. And uh, apparently he clammed up and he refused to elaborate. They were asking the most, uh, you know, that's logical annoying. question. 
they were like, well, who are, who the hell are they? And he goes, eh. Next question. <laughs> no, he didn't say, he didn't say the Soviets. I feel like that's, but you know, they, yeah, people are saying, you know, the, Reds, the, the, uh, the commies. Uh, oh, no, he didn't say that. Um, are you they, sure? They either. I don't think so. But the, 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 the scuttlebutt on the street was that he was probably referring to the Soviets um, because we know the CIA definitely tried to con- the CIA <laughs> convinced, tried to convince folks that it was probably the KGB. Mm-hmm. What does that stand for again? It's a Russian thing, so it's not an acronym that will be of any value to us, probably. But if we're on a roll mispronouncing complicated words in different languages, we should probably give it a try. Okay. Uh, how about the Komitat Gosudarvestivnoy Bezopasnosti? Bro. <laughs> Except no, it. it's terrible. It's terrible. Ah, pretty, it's not convincing to me. <laughs> it's Committee for State Security. Is mm-hmm. what that means. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, the KGB is going around and say, you know who Viva it was. Viva the questions. Sorry, that's from The <laughs> Office. I apologize. That's great. <laughs> that's, the, that's the Nazis you're talking about. Yeah. Well, they're saying know. it's the CIA. Well, also the KGB and the CIA both took a bunch of Nazis with them at the end of, you know, as part of their swag The ones bag. that were smart. <laughs> they took yeah. them. They kept them around, you know? Yeah. And so there's a big problem here. Because it's kind of like in that movie Clue, which is a great movie, where you realize everybody has a motive (laughs) for killing that one dude. The problem is the KGB, the CIA, and MI6, British intelligence, are all super active in the Congo because they all want some of that mining juice. They all want, like, they want uranium. They want uh, copper. They want, um, I think, cobalt as well. Like, they all have a reason for this guy to die and for Katanga to stay a secessionist state. Because Katanga was an active proxy conflict, let's say, right? A proxy war between communist forces and was it the West in general? Oh, yeah. or Okay. And, and I'm sorry I keep bringing up James Cameron's brilliant uh, uh, Avatar sequel, but he's super into this whole geopolitical idea that like when it comes to resource extraction, morality just goes out the window and like, you know, say what you will about the guy. And maybe he's a little too, you know, um, uh, far, 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 far left. And there's a middle ground, but you know, this is true. We've seen it for generations when it comes to getting the thing out of the dirt that you need and will make you money or will cause your country to have supremacy, morality goes out the window nearly every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or people define morality as making sure I get the resources I want. Yes. Unobtainium. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So there were a total of three contemporary inquiries into the crash. At the by which we mean like shortly after the crash. Uh, One each from the Rhodesian Board of Investigation which was probably corrupt. The Rhodesian Commission of Inquiry, which was probably corrupt. Wait, (laughs) hold up. What? (laughs) Investigation and inquiry. Yes. Yeah. How are those two different things? Well, we've investigated, but have we inquired? I would think they would go on the other way. You you inquire and then you investigate. You know, you pose the questions that need answering and then you uh, launch an investigation to answer those inquiries. Yeah, Yeah, you know, but they're like, ah, what's a little... What's a little assassination between friends? Uh, the, the third one is the United Nations Commission of Investigation, and they launch an inquiry. Anyway, <laughs> so, so we're just saying things get weird when, you know, you've got institutions using multiple languages, right? That's why, like, secretary general doesn't sound super impressive in American English, but you need to know that's the head honcho. These inquiries all fail to conclusively determine the cause of the crash. There's a lot of hedging, right? The Rhodesians, in both their inquiries and investigations, oh, it's in my head now, they find no evidence of bombs, nor missiles, nor hijacking. But their official report says a lot of curious stuff. They say two of the Swedish bodyguards aboard seem to have died from multiple bullet wounds. Whoa. Before Ooh. the plane hits the ground. So that's like 
World War II plane on plane kind of weaponry. That's what it sounds like to me. Oh, wait, unless it unless they were shot from the ground, which is possible. Weren't they nearing uh, the time to land the plane? Yes. So to paint to paint the uh, picture, I'm really glad you bring that up. So the it's late at night and the plane is flying down. It goes below its cruising altitude to where it's getting ready to land. And the pilot error story is that the the plane hit a hill that wasn't on the their maps. They didn't have the data for it, and they were kind of eyeballing it. And because they didn't see the hill, boom, history. But uh, we'll see whether that adds up. So the autopsy comes in, and the story shifts a bit. The medical examiners and authorities say, the there are gunshot wounds or there are bullet wounds, but they are superficial, and the um, the bullets that hit them appear to be unrifled, meaning it looks like they weren't fired out of a gun, uh, such that the authorities conclude there must have been a fire near where the bullets were stored, and then that made the cartridges explode, and it was near the bodyguards. So they got kind of, uh, it was almost like shrapnel instead of someone firing a gun at them. Whoa. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it's weird because in these initial inquiries and investigations, they also didn't find signs of foul play. And that's one of the, you know, big things that everyone is talking about nowadays and in the modern era it's it's people trying to come up with, well, what was the version of foul play that went down? But in those initial investigations, it was like, no, it looks like looks like nothing no, happened here. No ducks involved. Sorry. Mm-hmm. That was the worst pun to make. Because foul play. Oh my god. Oh, uh, no. or like a duck <laughs> no, strike no. or a <laughs> that's one of those that's a thing. <laughs> oh, Dark gosh. dark wing duck. Yes. Mr. McDuck. Never mind. Carry on. Carry on. The the origin story of Darkwing Duck. We've done it. But yeah, so the Rhodesians say, here's what happened. The plane flew, the pilot took the plane too low. They struck some trees because they were elevated on a hill. And this led to fatally grounding the plane. And then there were all these witnesses in the area who said, hey, I saw a bright flash in the sky. Now, this is not a place with a ton of light pollution, like you would expect in uh, New York City or Tokyo or London or whatever. This is a place where if something happens in the sky, you're going to see it if you're looking up. And these reports said, we're dismissing all of that. These are just stories. Let's go to the one guy, though, who survived in the hospital after the crash for a few days. This was Sergeant Harold Julian, who was uh, critically wounded. He survived the crash, but he did pass away in the hospital after five days. Um, His description of a series of explosions just before the crash uh, may well have been another narrative, a.k.a. bullshit, um, according to the U.N., because witnesses who talked to him sounded kind of inconsistent. So essentially what that means is the United Nations talked to witnesses in the hospital who spoke with Sergeant Julian before he died, and the UN chose to ignore everything those witnesses said because the UN thought their stories didn't match. Now, calling testimony inconsistent is a big umbrella term. You can you can fit a lot of stuff in there. It may seem like inconsistent can mean witnesses have conflicting reports. But it can also mean whomever is investigating was looking for stuff that didn't 100% match so they could say, fiddle dee dee, away with thee. Jeez. Well, if there was a big flash in the sky that. And explosions. That was an explosion, right? If you imagine that's probably what a large, bright flash in the sky would be, then you would imagine those inquiries when they're looking at the wreckage of the plane. Even if this thing was completely obliterated, and it was not, there were still large chunks of this plane intact, at least from the photos I've seen of the wreck, Um, you would be able to determine if part of that plane had exploded, I'm assuming. Maybe I'm just way off. I don't know. No, one would hope, right? And the uh, so it comes to pass that the official UN report comes out, same month as the crash, the first one. 
And they say, okay, the cause of the disaster is undetermined, but there was a bright flash in the sky before the plane hit the ground. And that's all they say. That's that's it. Uh, and this is why you can already see problems with the official story, folks, that Noel and Matt and I are, are, are picking apart in this live cooking right now. If Rhodesia's government is involved, we have to remember Rhodesia is a colonial vassal state and a lot of European powers can do whatever they want there. So Rhodesia would probably be logically too corrupt to conduct a real investigation or, <laughs> again, an inquiry. And if somebody in the United Nations uh, is powerful enough and they want DAG out of the picture, let's be honest. Uncle Sam and the big red bear of Soviet Russia could also screw with the UN investigation in a way that gives them plausible deniability and no consequences. Those are just two of the big problems, but there are a ton of other issues. So we talked about this documentary, 2019, right? Comes out, I think, after we do this video. And there are a couple of investigators who want to argue this is entirely pilot error. And they point out some good, some valid things. They say some of the people on the plane have been working for 17 of the previous 24 hours. They also point out the map maps didn't uh, include the correct altitude for these fields, which is how they missed the hills. We looked into that and both of those points are objectively correct. Uh, but there's other things. The first UN official to look at Dag's body said, hey, this guy has a hole in his forehead about the size of a bullet. And the later autopsy said, nah, psych. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it feels like there's either a hole in his head or not. Good God. Right. I don't feel like that's a matter of philosophy nor opinion. I'm with you with you there. Uh, the you guys also, heard the rumors that JFK's brain was completely switched out? Between yes, it was these. stolen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Just that old chestnut. To, I'm just trying to think of like, is there? Is there? I don't know. Just that kind of if if there was some kind of uh, interference with an autopsy like that, I don't know there. There are definitely precedents for that. Yeah, think about it. I mean, okay, autopsy sounds superficial, right? Uh, but when you get to how the uh, the corpse sausage is made, we have to remember there are only a few people. I'm sorry, Matt. We have to remember there are only a few people who are in the room with the body, right? And there is tremendous opportunity for those people to be uh, influenced. And anyway, I, I, I feel like I'm getting too close to casting doubt on all autopsies. That's not the case. That is absolutely not the case. But the UN came under some heat because they discarded a lot of other claims. There was an allegation that a South African mercenary would get drunk and then brag to people in public that he had participated in the assassination, which sounds like a dumb thing to do if you participated in an assassination. But also if you've met mercenaries or you know any job not a hundred percent of the people in the job are going to be the best and brightest so it's totally possible uh that somebody was talking out of their neck about it but the big thing is when they say undetermined as blasé as that phrase sounds what they're really saying is they cannot rule out sabotage or an attack or murder. Yeah, but but accusing a country or, you know, a company or individual would be damaging, right? Because they can't prove it. Right, right. Like think of again, um, Noel, to your point about geopolitics, like think of the the backlash. Think of how uh, what a terrible butterfly effect that is on all these carefully managed relationships. You're a diplomat, you're on good terms with somebody in Rhodesia, and then you get a phone call at 4 a.m. with somebody going, what the hell, Donnie? Yeah, like, why, <laughs> why'd you shoot down our spy balloon? Damn it, Donnie. <laughs> You're like a child who walks in the middle of a movie. You lost the plot, Donnie. <laughs> you were at my daughter's wedding, and you do this to me. <laughs> uh, so, so there are um, 
there are a lot of problems with this. And another, like if you get in the weeds just a little bit more, you'll see two other things I think that stood out to us, and especially these are not the only weird discrepancies, but they're two big ones. The rescue and search mission didn't start for hours after people knew the plane had crashed. It was delayed for some reason. That is incredibly abnormal, especially knowing that when planes are found to have crashed in remote areas, the entire world moves mountains to get there as soon as possible. And that just did not happen here, even though like the king of the UN is on board. Uh, and then there's a British high commissioner who was stationed at Ndola, and he hears that the plane is late. And then he hears about the crash and he doesn't seem, he doesn't just seem like non-stressed about it. He doesn't seem surprised. Oh dear. Well, perhaps man wasn't meant for the skies. Keep calm and carry on. That's the <laughs> classical, that's the officer's way. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's a stiff upper lip. Yeah. Did Dag happen to be on said plane? Oh, well. Oh, uh, how dreadful. Bit of a sticky wicket, I <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, Where is okay. my tea after all? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so it did not take very long for, again, alternative, let's call them narratives, to make the rounds or accusations, if that's more comfortable for people. Like we said, the KGB, first thing they do, accuse the CIA. And like we said, first thing CIA does, Accuse the KGB. Ah, uh, I knew a yeah. Spider Man meme, you know? Spider Man pointing at Spider Man pointing at Spider Man. Great, pointing at yes. Spider -Man. <laughs> perfect. Yes, that's perfect because, uh, because they're both in the same place because they want the same stuff and they both um, are kind of okay with instability in the Congo for a little while, so long as it means that they are going to be able to profit from it. We are the extractors of resources, not you. We are in control. Uh, but, you know, that's that's not where it ends, though, the CIA and the KGB, because there's some theories out there that Belgian or maybe even South African mercenaries working on somebody else's behalf may have been the ones to actually shoot something down. So a third party working for one of the major players. Which is how you want to do it, frankly. Mm, it's how you probably would do it if you were going to do it. And it's weird that we're talking about murdering people with the same kind of um, tone that you would talk about the right way to build a deck. But there really are right ways to do these things, or most effective ways. And so, yeah, the idea is that maybe MI6 or U.S. intelligence assets came through with their contacts and says, hey, you know. You guys are already messing stuff up down there. We just want you to mess up this one thing for us. Well, yeah. Cool. And theoretically, all you would need is one, like if one pilot or a small group of shooters that you wouldn't have to actually go to any heads of any mercenary group. You just get a couple mercs and get them to do a job that you pay them for. Wait, bro, what are you doing Saturday? Cool, cool. I was watching a movie with my uh, my partner the other night, and uh, Mercs came up, and she didn't know what Mercs was. I got to be like, I had to mansplain Mercs. No, it wasn't man it wasn't mansplaining because <laughs> she genuinely didn't know. So I was just actually telling her what Mercs were. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, mercenary forces are a very real thing again because they work. Uh, unless you're talking about the Wagner Group or Wagner Group, anyway. Uh, story for a different day, but read the reports there. I'm pretty sure they're getting drugged up. Uh, so, so both the CIA, KGB, and all kinds of people are in the mix who want to control the resource extraction. Install puppet governments who were um, okay with being corrupt, okay with the um, selling out the the people of their country uh, to have you know nice things for themselves in the short term. Tales old as time, terrible thing, and it it's happened any part of the world you look in the past, except maybe Antarctica. I don't know, <laughs> but maybe. Are you I sure? <laughs> I'm not. We haven't been to Big Murdo yet, and it's just a bunch just of gentle scientists the there doing God's work. 
Yeah, well, I don't know. Check out our episode. What happens <laughs> when yeah. murder occurs? Yeah, and wa- or I mean, watch the thing. Up. You know, yeah. yeah, they're cooped up. They're cooped up. Uh, so the decades grind on and on and on past the sixties. More and more evidence emerges that strongly indicates the official story is not true, and also just in the opinion of our show, strongly indicates there was some kind of hit at play. Um, All right, so we go to a different place in South Africa, 1998. The South African National Intelligence Agency has to turn over some files to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in the files, there's this thing that like is so tangential. doesn't really matter for the specific stuff that Truth and Reconciliation wants, but they they get some highly suspect trash talking from the CIA from the freaking director Alan Dulles just like a sideline too it's crazy this it's this shouldn't have existed uh here's the quote from CIA director Alan Dulles ready the, it, it includes an ellipsis so you just imagine there's some sort of blah, 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 something else being said okay here we go quote DAG is becoming troublesome, ellipses, and should be removed. You mean like <laughs> removed? No, 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 no. That just means, that just okay. means we okay. need somebody else okay. elected. Because remember, uh, DAG ah. came in after his predecessor left, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he got another five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just it's just the director of the CIA saying this guy needs to be, quote, removed. That's all. It, it reminds me of the... Uh, Super villain sketches for Mitchell and Webb. Sorry, I've been watching a lot of it recently. Where he's like, perhaps it would be better if blah 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 was taken care of. And there's one <laughs> guy who says, "Yeah, there's one guy who says, do you mean murdered? Because last time you told us to take care of someone, you know, we took him out for a very nice dinner and like blah blah." blah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. But of course, you're never gonna say openly. You're you're never gonna say. Kill that person. You're going to say, handle the situation, you know, with extreme prejudice or whatever. Anyway, so, all right. But, and also remember, those are files that the South African National Intelligence Agency had. So those are communications from the CIA to them. Or intercepted by them somehow. Right. Strange bedfellows, as always. Uh, So there's a book that comes out, this awesome book by an academic named Susan Williams called Who Killed Hammerschuld? And this seems to be the thing that actually triggers a reinvestigation. The United Nations, under then Secretary Ban Ki moon, says, okay, we're going to look back into it. So in 2017, they commission a new investigation into the crash. Uh, Ban Ki moon says they'll do it in 2016, but it's the UN. So, you know, it takes them a while to get up to gear. And uh, then 2019, this documentary, Cold Case Hammersold, comes out exploring the mercenary angle. And we already, okay, we see that people are finally admitting there's some sticky stuff. It's no secret that Belgian mining interests were backing that Katangan secession. And we're going to talk about that in a way that uh, a lot of mainstream or English news sources have not. When you read this story, from like your Wikipedias to your Guardian articles to what have you. Guardian does great journalism. You're always going to see it referred to vaguely as Belgian mining interest, which is a lot like saying computer company. You know what I mean? Like why, U.S. Where the computer specifics? company. U.S. computer company. I mean, interest also has a, it's a bit loaded. It implies uh, culpability, I would say, to a degree. If, if, if you've got something, you're, you're an interested party, you're a suspect. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it's also not really a secret that the U.S. and Belgium both 100% orchestrated the murder of Lumumba because he wasn't playing ball with Western corporations. They assassinated the crap out of that guy. And everyone was like, during the time, everyone was acting like, oh, it's so nuts. There's so much all civil disorder. Oh, gosh, we just wish there was a better way. We've but never copped him. to an assassination as a country, right? Have we? Mistakes were made. 
That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's all this kind of like veiled, vague language. It's never like we're like, yes, we definitely did that. It's another one of these narratives, you know? It's just the shifting narrative that's convenient for the, the ones that did the bad thing. Or Congress comes in and says, we had no knowledge of this. Yeah. Uh, just for my own sake here, guys, Lumumba was head of Katanga or or Rhodesia or... Uh, Congo. So Congo, Lumumba, okay. Yeah, so he was the first prime minister of um, the Congo when it went independent. It was called the Republic of the Congo, and now it's the modern day Democratic Republic of the Congo. Got uh, it. And yeah, and so when he even went to the United States, but he was um, he was ultimately executed, but it was definitely the West had a have a had a heavy hand in it and we could do an entire episode on that if people are interested in learning more. Um anyway, so at the very least, no matter how skeptical we want to be, and you should be skeptical in all things, we can say there were a lot of very powerful, very wealthy people who wouldn't be super upset. It wouldn't ruin their day if the Dagmeister didn't make it off that plane in one piece. If he were removed, let's if say, he from were, existence. <laughs> taken well care of. Yes. The last time you told us to remove someone, we just asked him to leave. <laughs> <laughs> he's still at he's still at Baskin Robbins. Um anyway, so <laughs> He's he's, he's almost out. through all 31 flavors. We <laughs> have clock, to make a show. We have to make a call. <laughs> the clock is ticking, gentlemen. Uh, so this is Code Pistachio brought to you by Stuff They Don't Want oh, You to Know. my favorite so, ice cream, by the way. I love it, too. I love it. Thank Man, you. It's so good. It's, 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 an, it's a controversial flavor. Some people are anti-pistachio. I'm not a big, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not a big sweet tooth person. Uh, but yeah, pista- oh, wow, Matt. You got a horse in the you don't race like on pistachio? this one? I do like pistachio, but thank I God, just, uh, coffee. If it's like coffee flavored or coffee involved in some way, like a mocha, that's where I'm at. That's all. Oh yeah, that's dope too. That's yeah. fair. But you're okay with pistachio? Oh right? yeah, we can still oh, yeah, be. We yeah, can yeah, still yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. We can still go to the Baskins together, right? Okay, cool. I think it's. I I think it's important to uh, exercise some strategy in group ice cream trips. I don't think people. I don't think you should ever get the same ice cream flavors. As your compatriots, I think you got to spread it out. You know, well, that's why I mean? you go to the Cold Stone where they do the mashups. You know, they mash them up. No, you yeah. know, and then you you get you get points for having the most creative concoction. It's like you know when you take the soda at the buffet and oh, you get yeah, all the different yeah, yeah. flavors. It doesn't necessarily end up uh, a good flavor, but you definitely showed that you're willing to try new things. I think the only thing I don't like about cold ice cream. Uh, Beside the fact that I eat ice cream maybe once every two years, is the uh, is that they they keep using the word slab and slab just sets it's off that my marble slab, baby. Yeah. slab, slab. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, actually technically called an anti griddle, which is fun. <laughs> what? That's yeah. Cool. No, nice. it's what it's called. It's like instead of a hot griddle, it's a cold griddle. It's called an anti griddle. Prophecy in the book of the griddle, right? The arrival of the anti griddle. Uh, so, so, uh, so Dag is on this slab and cannot tell his story. Uh, and he's long dead by the time Ban Ki-moon says, we're going to do this new investigation. And this, this is, um, really juicy stuff for the UN. Ban Ki-moon says, we're going to look into stuff like was Dag Hammarskjöld assassinated by an apartheid era South African paramilitary organization that was backed by the CIA, British intelligence, and a Belgian mining company? Whoa, who you been talking specific. to? Who you been yeah. talking to, Ban Ki Moon? Like, uh, <laughs> seems like you already got it all figured out. You know. Whoa. So the story continues. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsors, and we'll return with 2019, and then some modern twist. And we've returned. So according to one popular theory, uh, Kentangi's separatists ordered a Belgian mercenary pilot by the name of Jan van Rissigum to shoot down the secretary general's plane. 
Uh, Von Riesigam was mentioned as a possible suspect in a cable, one of those diplomatic cables we've heard so much about in the in the past handful of years, uh, sent by the U.S. ambassador to Congo just hours after the crash, um, but not declassified until 2014. Just, just want to clarify that a little bit. That's the U.S. ambassador to Congo right, right. after this thing happened. And he, uh, this person's <laughs> like, uh, you should look at this guy. Yo, uh, this, uh, is a, uh, this is a Belgian pilot that was trained by the Royal Air Force in Britain who is now over here fighting for the separatist. Uh, just, just you should look. Bit of a red flag. <laughs> and then Truman later says, they killed him. Yeah. Uh, to be clear, they. <laughs> 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 yeah, or to be completely vague, rather. <laughs> right. To be very vague, they killed him. Uh, so Jan van Rysgen, really interesting dude, never gets interviewed about the crash. Um, initially, people are saying the flight logs prove he wasn't in air at the time. And this is something that he maintains. Uh, he, maintained? When we say never it, maintained, <laughs> right. Spoiler. Um, and when we say never interviewed, he, he is not interviewed at the time. The way, even though people clearly like him for it, uh, that documentary we mentioned earlier, Cold Case Hammerschold, uh, interviews people who spent time with Jan afterwards. Folks like Pierre Coppens, Coppens, who is a uh, parachutist, knows Van Rissingham, and Pierre swears up and down. He's like, look, I hang out with the guy. We're sitting around at the bar. We're sitting around waiting for the rain to die down so we can walk away. He starts mentioning the story in bits and pieces. And uh, he tells me he brought down this plane in Zambia back in the day. And he feels bad because he didn't know the leader of the UN was aboard, which is a weird kind of like, you know, people are all storytellers, I guess, but that's a pretty consistent story to tell. And yeah, uh, yeah there's this other guy named Roger Bracco. Oh, this is the thing. So Van Rissingham's uh, story about his flight logs, his flight books, his log books, are that, uh, you know, he's a professional. He's not some Boy Scout. This isn't Mickey Mouse stuff. It's important. And his flight logs have not been doctored. But multiple other people, including a guy who was flying around the same time in the same area, Roger Bracco, talk about how Van Rissigem's logbooks are riddled with forgeries, like fake names, weird times, all sorts of shady stuff. And uh, Van Rissigem is never charged with anything related to this, no accusations, um, despite the fact that multiple weird things are, are coming out over the decades. Um, back to the book by Susan Williams. And a couple of other sources have confirmed this. A former U.S. spy came forward after the fact and uh, and said, look, I was posted at what's called a listening station in Cyprus. This is um, this is the old days before, you know, like the NSA or someone could just vacuum up all electronic data, communication yeah. data. Yeah. It's all analog and humanly operated. Yeah. So this guy is just sitting there with some headphones Tuning in to stuff, checking, shut up, making shut up, sure shut up. It's, it's coming in. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Wait, it's the Dick Van Dyke show. Damn it. Um, <laughs> so uh, he's this spy says that they heard a recording of a pilot pretty much narrating the attack as it unfolds. The same kind of the same way that um, in the earlier days of the internet, people would film street fights while they were happening. And like narrate them while screaming "World Star." That's one for yeah. the internet heads. <laughs> or like these these guys will watch Major League Baseball and then just like tell you what's happening on the mm -hmm. screen. Oh wait, that's just that's just radio. That's just announcers. Yeah, yeah. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're they're the ones who have a job doing that. But uh, but yes, this um, and it is a skill set. We're not dinging you guys. Um, no, I freaking so, love yeah. it. I'm just joking. I love it too. That's it. I mean, it's kind of a tough job too when you think about it, because it's like when do you talk versus when do you let people like? Eh. I feel like it's easier in slower sports. Yeah, I think you're right. You can tell. You could like. There's never. There's never somebody announcing a billiards game, screaming like, and that's the seven in the pocket or anything. You know, the same way people in football scream goal 
whatever. No, we want to get pretty excited yeah. about billiards, but they call it snooker. Mm. No, that's why they get excited. <laughs> We've solved it. So anyway, there's this guy doing this like uh, sports announcement. It's not a sports announcement. It's procedural stuff. A pilot would say. Um, and this is transmitted just minutes after the crash, once they've lined up the timetables. And then Pierre Coppens, the parachutist, says his buddy, his bar buddy, Jan, lays out the details of this complicated plan, names the jet he uses, and then describes the plan over time, like how he has to strip all this stuff out of the plane. He has to install a weapon on the plane. He has to reduce the weight for his range, add fuel tanks, tells him where he took off from, and then um, how it was a huge challenge to take a jet into the air from where he did. But he's just that good. Because pilots like surgeons sometimes like to talk about how they're that good. At least like this kind of this kind of pilot, he fits that thing. I, you know, we actually have a lot of fellow conspiracy realists who are pilots and and be safe up there because you're doing hard work that most people cannot do. You're literally in rarefied air. Did Jan shoot down the plane? We'll never know for sure. He died in 2007, never went to court, never like the accusations never got official. He was never even officially interviewed as part of an inquiry. And no, remember, no. the fact of his potential involvement was only declassified seven years after his death. It's crazy. That's nuts. Yeah. I mean, it happens. Like, that's why. Why does everybody think we keep checking on whether or not Henry Kissinger is alive each given day? As a matter of fact, hold on. I don't care. Oh, no. Oh, it's not going to be today. <laughs> it's not going to be today. It's, one day it will be. Uh, that's what he says every day he wakes up. Not today, death. Not today. Not today. Not today. Uh, yep. Nope. He is going to be 100 years old on May 27th this year. Anyhow. So- and Cheney is also alive. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, we've done our checks. Uh, look, as we're wrapping up here, it seems pretty clear to, I want to speak for everybody, but it seems pretty clear it's just my opinion that Dag Hammarskjöld was murdered uh, because the independence of a peaceful Congo that was representing the interest of its people instead of selling out to Western powers was a threat to profits and to the ability to build powerful weapons of war. I mean, you know, it's it's happened all the time. Like the colonialism stuff never really ended. There's a real reason France begged everyone to take down Gaddafi and it wasn't human rights. I mean, to put a fine point on it, it was control of the currency. Anyway, what, like this doesn't, this is where we should end. So the thing that doesn't get mentioned often, talked about it, mining interest. Belgian mining companies, very vague, because for some reason, no one wants to say the mining union of Upper Katanga, which is it. That's that's who did it. That's who participated in it. Uh, they don't get name checked. Okay, I wouldn't say it for sure, but very likely that they are the ones who did it because this mining company runs so deep from 1906 to 1967. It is, uh, it is the biggest business in the Belgian Congo, and after for a short time after the uh, country goes independent, it functions as a state power, just like um, oh, uh, they're Chiquita now, United Fruit Company in Guatemala. They were a state power basically, uh, and this mining company is like building schools, hospitals sporting arenas mm. so it's like the announcers there are probably paid by the mining well that's company. the thing at a certain size and scope in a free market economy like a business becomes indistinguishable from a government entity because of the connections they're in you know mm-hmm. it certainly gets weird like that i know there are a lot of companies that were like that in the u.s i want to say guys i can't remember if it was in the 40s or 50s maybe 50s and 60s where it's like in that Ohio River Valley area, uh, kind of up in the northeast of the U.S., where there are whole towns that were built around the factory, and then schools get built by the fa- by the company and mm-hmm. all that stuff. Same thing. 
Ao Maso to the company store. Yep, yeah, the company store where you could use currency that the company would give Scrip. you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ben Bucks. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Well, it's on the way back. Uh, company towns, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, so just to give you a snapshot here, folks, this mining interest, which uh, in 1967, it it banded together with some other places to become plain old mining union, took Upper Katanga out of the name. But uh, in 1959, uh, the Belgian profits from this were 3.5 billion Belgian francs in 1959 money. And export, right. And the export duties that they paid to the government of Congo were 50% of the entire government revenue. Holy snaky. Yeah. In 1960, this one company made 60% of all the uranium that was used by the West, 70% of all the cobalt, 10% of the copper, distant third, but still, that's a lot of copper, right? Uh, yeah. So this thing's like, real. All the copper? Yeah, that's a lot of copper. This thing's real important. Yeah. Yeah. They've got they they've got the uh big stick to swing around, right? To our Roosevelt reference earlier. When the larger Congo became independent, this is the company that bankrolled the secession of Katanga, because they thought, oh no, this uh this new government is coming in, they might nationalize our assets, they might stop our grift, they might take our profits. Uh, the Katanga se- secession does eventually fail, but only after that uh, President Lumumba is wiped off the map. Maybe not right as he, right, maybe, maybe he's still alive, but he's fallen from power. Eventually, the Congo does take over that mining company, or big, big chunks of it. Production falters and fails. The official narrative for why it falters and fails is that there was a lack of expertise once it got nationalized. But there are, there's a lot of shadowy space to put some intervening variables in there. And knowing what we know about the high likelihood that mining companies and their operatives in intelligence agencies did wax Dag Hammarskjöld, we have to ask, what happened to the mining company? You know, th- they've done such a great job of staying out of English language news. I, I, th- I think you got to reveal this one, Ben. You found it, man. You discovered it. In 2001, the mining union became a company called Umicor, Umicor, UMI Cor. And uh, they are still in business today. No one got in trouble. No one went to jail. They're doing less mining now. If you go to their website, they want you to know that they're super into recycling. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm, 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 I'm placated. Oh, good. Yeah, me too. And Umicore just sounds, it's like a, like an anime, you know, streaming service or something, you know, it just sounds really like friendly. Yeah. Yeah. I would just have to, I think we have to say we cannot prove that they had anything to do with the death of Hammerschold, but something feels like, it feels like they did, right? Wink. Okay, yes, that's true. We cannot prove this. They have never been um, uh, charged or the company has never been convicted. And that's a predecessor company. You know, It may be very different from the current interest today. It almost certainly is, right? But we can say that they were by far the largest resource extraction operation at the time, uh, they had a very vested interest in the Katanga region, mm-hmm. and <laughs> Dag Hammarskjöld was probably murdered by someone. Uh, so, <laughs> like that's, I think we can say that safely. But at this point, you know, we we know we've gone a little bit long. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's episode, and we want to we want to pass it to you, fellow conspiracy realists. What do you think? Are there other fatal accidents that you believe might have been purposeful murders or assassinations, we would love to hear about these, especially if they're stories like that of Dag Hammarskjöld, which has kind of fallen off the mainstream map. Everybody knows or has their own opinions about JFK, Martin Luther King Jr., RFK, and so on. But uh, we want to hear about the Dags. 
of the world because there are way more out there than most people suspect. That's right. And you can get in touch with us via the internet if you wish. We are Conspiracy Stuff on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, where we have a Facebook group called Here's Where It Gets Crazy, Conspiracy Stuff on Instagram, and TikTok. We have a book, and if you like learning about assassinations, there's a whole chapter in there for you. Check it out. book is called Stuff They Don't Want You To Know. You can find it in audiobook form and real book form all over the place. We also have a phone number if you like talking on the phone. That's true. You can give us a call wherever you are at in this wide, wide world, any time of day. Time zones don't matter when it comes to telephones. Uh, It's 1-833, say it with us, S-T-D-W-Y-T-K. You'll hear a hopefully familiar voice. You'll hear a beep like so. Beep. That is your signal to uh, that's that's like your gun at the racetrack. You got three minutes. They're yours. Run the course. Go wild. Get nuts. Give yourself that nickname. You always want to tell us if we can use your name and or uh, voice on air. And uh, most importantly, don't censor yourself. If you have links to send us, if you have pictures, if you have something that needs more than three minutes to explain, we cannot wait to hear from you. All you have to do is drop us a line at our good old fashioned email address where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.